During the 1960s, something drastic happened within the world of engine development that literally changed the course of motorcycle and engine design forever. And it helped put the Japanese manufacturers on the map globally, and it's called the two-stroke. <laughs> While the two-stroke had always been there, it's more what happened to the two-stroke. See, this simple engine configuration went from powering small, utilitarian scooters and motorcycles to powering the fastest race bikes in the world. But most people, myself included, prior to reading this amazing book called Stealing Speed by Matt Oxley, well, most don't know how or why. And it turns out it's one of the craziest stories in motorcycle history. Our story starts in post-war East Germany with two characters, Walter Kaden, known as the father of the modern two-stroke engine, developing the technology for the East German motorcycle manufacturer, MZ, and another character named Ernst Degner, the standout rider for MZ's race program. Ultimately, this was a sort of Cold War story, the battle between not only communist and capitalist ideology, but also engine development and race technology. And the short of the story is that MZ really had the upper hand as sort of an underdog. Their two-stroke 125 was the first race engine, both in cars and motorcycles, to make 200 horsepower per liter without supercharging. Now this transformation of the two-stroke that was happening at MZ, a company that you've probably never heard of for reasons we'll see shortly, well that came about because of secret leftover technology learned during World War II from Germany. It's important to understand that the Germans were innovating in terms of many different forms of engineering both before World War II and during World War II, so after World War II a lot of these engineers were very sought after and just getting a hold of the information and the technology that was being developed by Germany was really important for so many countries. Now, Walter Kaden, MZ's lead engineer, had worked for Nazi Germany in development specifically of Hitler's V-1 cruise missile, the first weapon of its kind named Vengeance Weapon 1 by Hitler. This was a solo waterborne missile capable of 400 miles per hour. This missile was powered by a simple combustion engine known as the Pulse Jet, carrying just enough fuel to make it to London. And Hitler, he wanted a bunch of them, with the later versions of the V-1 one essentially being his hope for winning the war. The Allies gained intelligence of this long-range weapon capable of mass destruction, as just one V-1 could potentially lead to 4,000 deaths, and the fact that the V-1 was now being mass-produced in Germany at a secret facility meant that they wanted to stop this. So the Allies bombed Pinamunde, the place where all of this R&D for the V-1 was taking place, and this was the home at the time to engineer Walter Codden, who managed to survive this attack. So this was August 18th, 1943. Now, like many Germans at the time, Cotton was not a Nazi, at least not by choice. He was primarily a motorcycle enthusiast, having worked at DKW, developing two-stroke technology prior to the war. Now, Cotton survived the war along with the famed German engineer Werner von Braun, who, as is known, went to work for NASA. German engineers, like I said, were highly sought after with the overlap of World War II and the Cold War, and Cotton wasn't sure he would survive as the war came to an end, Ultimately, he had the option to go to the U.S. with Von Braun, but he chose to stay in Germany, a decision that would turn out both good and bad for him. By 1945, Kaden was home in Chopa, Germany, now controlled by communist Russia. The Russians were mainly searching for the secret home of DKW, the innovative German motorcycle and car manufacturer that had won the lightweight Isle of Man in 1938 with their two-stroke 250cc Lada Pumpe. I'm probably not pronouncing a lot of these words right, but forgive me. Kaden had grown up around the buzz of DKW in his hometown, and that was his workplace prior to the war. But after the war, his hometown of Chopa was crawling with Russians, and he had no desire to become a prisoner of war in Russia like so many other Germans, so he hid in his house while his wife would go out and scavenge for food and steal potatoes and stuff. In 1946, Cotton and a friend started their own business making wooden roof components, but riding around on a small DKW two-stroke bike was his favorite pastime. Now he started racing the little bike and slowly started working to basically make it faster using what he had learned working both for DKW but also his development of engine technology under the Nazis. But in 1952, Codden's private workshop was all but cut off from materials like any private enterprise at this time in East Germany. See, Codden wasn't just not a Nazi. He also wasn't a communist either. He just wanted to move on with his life. He didn't care about politics. But he was given a job at DKW again 
this point IFA, you know, they changed the name, but ultimately it would turn into the company MZ. Now this was kickstarted by the Soviets as they wanted Germany to compete for automotive dominance once again. Cotton was to head up the new motorcycle race team. See, they'd seen him flying past the old DKW factory on his little old 125 two-stroke, and they saw that that bike was going quite a bit faster than it probably should have. Now, at this time, and really through his entire time with MZ, he worked in entirely primitive conditions. Germany was in shambles at this point after the war. There really wasn't much left of the country, and this really was a true underdog story, what he was able to do. And his first job was to build a batch of 125 cc race bikes for their team and for local racers so he would work all day long every day this was what he loved doing and a lot of innovation happened at this point working on these little two strokes one of those things being you know adding rotary valve induction which is one of the key parts of how he was able to make two strokes faster and make them work but at its heart the main innovation made from cotton at this time had to do with the very nature of what an internal combustion engine is and the main difference between a two stroke and a four stroke see cotton understood something very few engineers at this time did and that is that a two stroke isn't simply half of a four stroke in its function. While a four stroke is essentially a pump with four phases, you know, suck, squeeze, bang, blow, or, you know, more properly, induction, compression, combustion, and exhaustion. Matt Oxley writes that the two stroke lives and breathes on resonances and harmonics pressure waves and other mysterious forces. Cotton knew that the two-stroke engine functioned more like an organ than a pump. The two-stroke delivers twice as many power strokes as the four-stroke. This is why later on down the road as two-strokes took over racing, Honda's only way of combating the onslaught of two-strokes was to make their four-stroke machines rev past 20,000 RPMs. If they could get twice as many revolutions, they would then be able to match the power strokes of a two-stroke. Prior to Cotton's work, though, the two-stroke suffered from a few shortcomings in comparison. At its core, making more power from an internal combustion engine is about stuffing as much air and fuel into the combustion chamber as fast as possible, and this is what two strokes struggle with. So Cotton began to incorporate what he learned from working on Hitler's V1 into the two-stroke problem because that pulse jet engine was pretty similar and had similar problems. And figuring out how to make the pulse jet go fast was very similar to figuring out how to make a two-stroke go fast. He figured out a way to harness the sound waves in the exhaust to create more power, as had been done on the V1 missile, creating his own unique exhausts, finding 20% more power essentially overnight. He was essentially supercharged the engine for free. Basically having a larger space for the exhaust to get to quicker meant more room for the gas-air mixture to fill up within the combustion chamber. This was Caden's crowning achievement, perfecting the structure of the expanse chamber, fixing the exhaust phase problem in the same way that his rotary valve had fixed the inlet phase. So at this point, all that two-stroke goodness was finally starting to be captured and utilized. But any slight change to the exhaust's cone angle would change the power significantly and even change where the power was delivered. And so these odd looking exhaust systems, they were anything but pleasant to look at and they still really aren't on powerful two strokes, but they were handmade and perfected to get the most power possible. And all of this done in horrible working conditions with sparing supplies and materials, the resources just weren't there. It wasn't like he was backed by some incredible incredibly wealthy team. I mean, they didn't even have a dyno for which to test power output. They would just make changes and then ride the bikes around and see if they felt faster. It was sort of an art form at this point. In 1955, the team set out for the German GP at Nürburgring. That is very hard to say for some reason, because it's I'm wanting to say Nuremberg, but it's Nürburgring. Anyways, at this point, MV Augusta was the reigning king of the 125cc GP class, the complete opposite in terms of team makeup and structure to that of MZ, the German company that Cotton was representing. While MV was literally ran by a count, funded by endless old Italian money, over in communist Germany, Cotton scrounged for decent tools and materials. Everyone who saw the MZ team tent at the Isle of Man would gawk, why is this sad little commie team wasting its time with these outdated two-strokes? Now, the little two-strokes didn't beat the MV Augustas on their first go, but they did come in fifth and sixth place, surprising everybody. And going into the 56 season, they decided to sign a new young talent to ride their bikes, Ernst Degner. And this is the other main character for the story. 
The 56 and 57 season weren't good for MZ despite their small improvements, again in the area of resonance and exhaust. But in 58, after continued ongoing work on the two-stroke platform, working to sort of eke every bit of horsepower out as possible, he now had a 20 horsepower 125 and Degner, the rider, was getting faster and faster every time. They came in fifth at the TT and then they got their first podium at Nürburgring always behind the MV4 strokes, but getting quicker. Then, a few weeks later, the team scored their first GP win at the Swedish Grand Prix 250cc class. It's interesting to me that they got their first win at the Swedish Grand Prix. As we'll see later, we come back to the Swedish Grand Prix, and that's where the story, it kind of culminates there. Cotton wasn't done yet, though. Despite his two strokes revving higher than ever, overheating was keeping them from really gaining horsepower. These bikes were always on the verge of blowing up. So Cotton scoured old, dusty textbooks like a wizard trying to solve a problem in a fantasy story. And he discovered a system utilized in the 1930s by Zundep on a two-stroke system whereby oily gas was fed through an extra port to the often overheated small end bearing underneath the piston. Really, with two strokes, it's about getting the oily parts of the gas, oil mixture, to go where you want it. And this solved that problem of always overheating. To his marvel, not only did he keep the engine cool, it produced another 10% power. So this extra transfer port increased the volumetric efficiency, essentially getting more gas into the cylinder for more power. Altogether, his innovations were such. A rotary valve, an expansion chamber, and now a boost port, as we know all of these things. Over about five years, Cotton, by himself, had done more innovation than all of the big manufacturers, and his bikes were continuing to get faster. So 22 horsepower was now coming out of the MZ125. They had a serious GP contender on their hands with this bike and with Degner. So the MZs started beating the four strokes and famed riders were waiting in line for a try, but crashes and a lack of money really left them with no big rider. And Ernst Degner was really their last hope at winning a title. He was just as fast as anybody in the smaller classes, but he was also a bit of a selfish, arrogant guy. Racing during this time was rough. Grand Prix riders died every month, sometimes two a month. In 1951, just as one example, Moto Guzzi lost its two main riders during a test lap for a race. One rider ended up so far ahead of his teammate, and he thought that his teammate had crashed, so he turned around to go find him, and the two riders crashed head-on and both were killed. There was loads of problem, obviously woefully inadequate gear, a careless approach from race organizers, a lot. I mean, it was just a perfect storm for fatalities and injuries and riders just died all the time. Now the riders would deal with this reality differently, but for Degner, he wanted out, and it wasn't just that he didn't want to crash and die, he wanted out of East Germany. Despite MZ treating him as best as they could, providing him with housing and, you know, the best cool car that they could afford for him as sort of a celebrity in East Germany, MZ could not pay him his worth, regardless of his performance, and he just didn't like looking over at all the big riders from different countries and how they lived like absolute celebrities driving around in, you know, Aston Martins and Ferraris. And it was the perfect storm for betrayal for Degner. Meanwhile, over in Japan, Suzuki was struggling. The MZs were too fast for everybody, and Suzuki's two strokes, they just weren't good. Despite their size and resources as a company, they simply hadn't figured out what Cotton had. But hope was there. They knew two strokes could be made to go fast. They just didn't know how to make them go fast. And they didn't want to take on the years of research necessary to figure out what Cotton had figured out. And, you know, just because you have a bunch of people working and a bunch of engineers, you can't pay your way to figuring these kinds of things out. And it's more than just one setup that works all the time. You know, these two strokes would always have to be fiddled with and Cotton fit all sorts of extra features like a lever to control and change the mixture on the go. So while you'd be riding, you'd, you know, head up a hill and the elevation would change and you'd change the mixture just a bit. It was a very complex thing riding these race two strokes in the 60s. He even had an engine kill button used to power down the engine between gear shifts. Essentially, that was a precursor to the modern quick shifter. Now, Ernst Degner, the racer for MZ, he knew these machines inside and out and he knew two stroke technology better than most. Cotton was essentially his mentor, and going into the 61 season, he began to take even more interest in learning the inner workings of the MZ125 race machine. The team was delighted with this, but they didn't know that Degner had other motives. 
It was June of 61 at the team hotels for the Isle of Man TT, where Degner struck a deal with Suzuki's fixer, Jimmy Matsumiya, and the deal was this, all of Cotton's secrets to making two strokes more powerful, and in return, a whole bunch of money for Degner to defect from the communist GD art and also to race for Suzuki. Matt Oxley, the writer of this awesome book that you guys should go buy, he calls this the biggest industrial espionage heist in motorsport history. Never before, as far as we know, have race secrets been stolen so brazenly. Now, Cotton wasn't done at this point. The MZ125 kept getting faster, and his MZs were winning the championship at this point. 25 horsepower was being produced from this bike at this point. The championship was all but theirs. Not only was this bike now making 200 horsepower per liter, everything was updated with proper modern features, modern frame and suspension. Everything was better on the bike. This secret meeting in June was Degner's first face-to-face -face meeting with Suzuki's team, and the deal they struck was essentially this, 10,000 pounds and a factory Suzuki ride for the 62 World Championship. Now, this was a lot of money back then, a lot, especially for a factory rider, almost 10 times what the other Suzuki rider would get. Suzuki would need to see the full 22 horsepower on their 125 bike, for the full 10k to get paid out and this was why Degner was spending so much time this season with Cotton working on the bikes he had to know them inside and out to be able to replicate it for Suzuki's bikes now East Germany was bad at this time and Degner wanted what the Western riders had freedom and just a better life and in 61 they did start to have problems engines were blowing up somewhat suspiciously it does seem that Degner was trying to win, though. It wasn't like he didn't want to win the championship. But on August 12th, with the championship all but his, the Berlin Wall went up overnight, initially a barbed wire fence dividing families and making his escape impossible. But then obviously, they quickly started pouring concrete and turning it into a giant wall. Now, a friend and co-conspirator in the Suzuki deal named Paul Petrie helped get his family out of East Germany first. And the plan was then that he would defect from a different country for a different race. Now, the Swedish Grand Prix is where it all went down for Degner. MZ and Cotton had every reason to be confident in the 125's ability to win the race, which would have essentially won the championship for them. This track was set up for bikes with a lot of power and a lot of speed. Shortly after the race started, Degner was way ahead, and then he disappeared. The engine on his bike had blown up. And with Degner's soon escape from Sweden, MZ would never see the championship at this point. If he had won that race, it would have been theirs. If he had raced the next few races, it probably would have been theirs. But early in the morning, the day after the race in Sweden, Degner met with Matsumiya with a secret bundle of not only the engine specifications for the MZ125, but even various parts like a piston and rotary valve and crankshaft. So Suzuki had what they needed, and in 62, with just a year of development, they took their first Grand Prix title with Degner in the new 50cc Grand Prix using Cadence Tech for two-stroke development. In 63, they would then take the 125 and actually take the top seven places of the 50cc class. The two-stroke technology pioneered by Cotton would slowly take over Grand Prix racing and really build the Japanese manufacturers into the companies that they are today to the demise of Cotton and MZ. There is no Suzuki without Cotton's work. It's a key part of the racing history and business reputation starting during these competitive times in the 60s. Without their two-stroke technology, Suzuki wouldn't come out of the Japanese market as one of the big four. They proved themselves on the racetrack, but they did it with stolen tech. It's funny, Suzuki says in their video series on their racing history that Ernst Degner had an active role in development, which as one commenter points out, that's just a really nice way to describe corporate espionage. Over the next decade, Suzuki would battle Honda in the four-stroke, two-stroke war, but slowly, even Honda's high-revving machines found their match as the two strokes got bigger and faster. Suzuki took their first 500cc Grand Prix win in 71 with a two stroke, the first two stroke to take a victory. And this was really the beginning of the end. You know, two strokes would dominate until they were then banned in GP decades later. Of course, the other manufacturers would have figured it out some way. I mean, this tech wouldn't have just stayed hidden with MZ. But what happened down the road for MZ and Cotton is a different story. You know, it didn't end up good for him being in East Germany at this time with their main rider defecting 
to another country. And who knows what would have happened to Suzuki in their struggles to keep up. We might not have the Suzuki we have today without their racing success in the 60s and 70s built on the back of stolen research and development. You can't help but wonder if the big two strokes from Suzuki and Kawasaki would have ever even been built without this theft. But in the end, Suzuki, though a pioneer on their own and certainly deserving of much of their success, though at this point today they're definitely falling behind as one of the laziest manufacturers in motorcycling, you wonder if that DNA was already there back in the 50s and 60s. You know, when Honda was putting in the hard work and spending the money necessary to innovate and win championships, Suzuki just decided to try and skip all that and steal someone else's hard work. I was going to end this video with a harsh critique of Suzuki today, contemplating even further if maybe the the original lazy spirit behind this heist 50 years ago isn't still present today. But I think, if anything, I hope that this video reaches people who would otherwise not know about Cotton and his work. If you have ridden or you currently ride a fast, competitive, performance-oriented two-stroke in any capacity, you owe something to MZ. But MZ doesn't get any of the credit. We all look back at the great Kawasaki and Suzuki two-strokes of the 70s, but really it all started with MZ. Even if you ride a little or big two-stroke dirt bike that has that specifically shaped exhaust to create power from the engine. That all started with Walter Cotton and MZ. So if anything, I hope this video is a way of remembering him and yeah, it's just kind of a crazy story in motorcycling history. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already and check out some of my other similar videos. But yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed. We'll see you in the next one. Ride safe.